You can hear me okay. I can hear you perfectly okay. Fabulous, yes. love, excellent. The Australian internet is going to be fully tested today, folks. <laughs> Good. Good afternoon, Melanie. Good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Uh, all things considered. All things considered. <laughs> there are a lot of things to. You might be what? Might be the drugs. Yeah. It might be the drugs. Okay. <laughs> no, no, Let's I'm hope, hope the, the drugs hold out for the next hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. This is really cool. I had no idea how interesting this might be until we started talking like 10 minutes ago. And it turns out, you know, quite a lot about the current situation. You're involved with a whole lot of academics. I know you from being involved with like tech startups, etc. Um, you've got this master's degree in marketing. So I think this is going to be a really cool chat. I'm really excited about this. Yeah, thank you. Me too. Excellent. Cool. Sorry? I'm, I'm quite jealous that you're in Bali. I feel like that's, um, I, I lo I've loved my travels there and I'm missing my travel with the lockdowns and, and the border. Yes. Yes. Well, I am stuck here in Bali. It's absolute torture. You know, I you know we only that. have 32 degree temperatures every day, sunshine every day, surf three days out of four you know it's it's a real struggle but we are struggling on here we will come through this together in bali good good man keep it together <laughs> i will try and keep it together <laughs> cool and where are you you are in um sydney you're in sydney yes i'm in sydney and um and so actually the weather's pretty good here it's it's not bad uh, it is winter, but the Australian winter is is nothing to be worried about. I think we no. might have hit ten degrees. That was that was a moment. You know, we're we're, we're, doing, we're we're coping fine. Okay, great. That's really good news. Excellent. Okay, cool. So we are here today to talk about marketing, and um, so I only have like four or five questions. The four or five questions, as you know, are how are you qualified to talk to us about marketing? what it is that you do, who it is that you do it for, how you do it, how you deliver success for your customers, how you feel about marketing, and what your recommendations are for people in the current situation. So maybe we should get started at the beginning, and you can tell us all how you are qualified to talk to us about marketing. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I got into marketing via sales, and I really discovered that sales and marketing should be, I think this is no revelation to anyone, should be far more connected than they are. So I started my own company. I did the sales. I did the marketing. And, um, you know, but I had previously worked with organisations as the salesperson. And it used to frustrate, frustrate me in sales that the marketing folk would send out these messages that the sales folk had to translate to the customer. Um, and they weren't always on message. So there was a disconnect. And I guess from there, um, you know, continuing to work in sales, I really started to want to have, have that influence in, in, in marketing. Um, I, I then um, did a master's degree in, uh, in marketing, but to my mind, there was two types of marketing. There was marketing for big organisations who have already got strong brands and really what they're doing is protecting their brand and, and, and looking normal and all that. And then there is marketing for innovation. So if you're a startup or you're a disruptor brand, you have a very different set of challenges because nobody knows who you are. There's no trust. You have a completely different set of issues. My interest was not in how do you market Coca-Cola, Nike, whatever. It was much more, what if you were developing a set of sports shoes and no one had heard of you? What do you have to do? And so through that, I did a bit of research. Um, and the, really the findings from that is, is what makes, I suppose, my, my give me some credentials around marketing. And, and that was really get endorsed by the right endorser, win awards if you can. And it doesn't really matter what category that is in. Um, it could be best, fastest growing, nice place to work, environmental policy, just win something um, and look normal. And so there was some really great. Okay, questions. sorry, yeah, Melanie, yeah. can I stop you for a second? I'm getting sure. screeched at from downstairs. They don't know I'm on a call, but they will do in 20 seconds. Right, I will cut this little bit out. Oh, we had a good chat without you. 
Who? <laughs> Me and the audience. Oh, okay, good. All right, well, I've closed that door. So I don't, I'm not sure if you were hearing the dog barking, but I was. And yeah. somebody's just arrived downstairs that I think I'm supposed to know. I've got no idea who it is. So, um, so, so I've locked this door now. It's a little bit darker, but it should be quieter. Good. This is interesting. This is really interesting because I've never even considered it in these terms is the truth. I should have done before. But of course, depending where you are, although maybe I have, because this is kind of what I tell people, depending where you are will dictate entirely what it is that you need to do with your sales and marketing. Yeah. Good. Okay. And so when I first knew you, you were working with SYNC, which is the Sussex Innovation, Innovation Center. Yes. So the end didn't stand for anything. They just didn't want to call it sick. Well, sync isn't really much better, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Not really much better, no. But still, yes, working with startup companies for 10 years in the UK, setting up investor networks and all of that. So a lot of work in uh, working across the ecosystem for startups. So if you were going to ask someone, how does a startup do marketing? That was me because I was a virtual board member for, for many of those 500 companies. At any given time, we'd have about 500 clients. Um, they're still going now very strongly. They've won many awards, including UK Business Incubator of the Year. So I was in there setting up a lot of the, the programs and, and so on and had the privilege of working with many of them to get their first customer, which is often the big thing. So sales and marketing really come together for that. Yes, they really do. Okay, and I want to agree with what you're saying. I also came to marketing from sales. Before I started the Effective Marketing Company, I'd been in sales for like 10 years. And the reason I started a marketing company is because I, what I used to say is I'd seen the marketing people lord it up with all of the budget and none of the target, while the salespeople had all of the target and none of the budget. And then I realized that marketing were as in bad shape as the salespeople, but they were both at loggerhead. So I get that entirely. Okay, so I'm interested in this innovation. I'm interested in how you get your first sale. I'm interested in that. Maybe we should understand what it is that you do now. So we've got that kind of overview and then we can go back through the other things, if that's cool. Yeah, well, now um, I work for an organization called Crazy Might Work. It's an innovation consultancy firm. And I guess our point of difference is that we really are focused on the experience of innovation, the journey towards impact with innovation. So we use a lot of different methodologies to arrive at the innovation. And so that could be design thinking, systems thinking, appreciative inquiry, and, and so on, neuroscience. So drawing from all of these multiple methodologies, we bake a cake, which is driving innovation, and then our focus is on impact. And we feel the best way to do that is through the experience you have on that journey of innovation and the people you get in the room, which is from across the system. So it's really much harder to affect a really a change if you're, if you're on your own. Much more simple if you bring the whole system together and then, and then try to sort of you know, shift something in, in a particular direction. And we have seen the COVID pandemic do that. And so I guess we, we have worked with New South Wales Health um, in Australia and the team we worked with there went on to develop the tracing and tracking program for the virus that, that they wouldn't have done had they not gone through our program. And they, they will tell you that. So we're, we're really proud of that. The impact, of course, is that now in Australia, we have a 21 day, really a guarantee that we can trace and track everyone from a case. So if a case happens within 21 days, we can have traced, tracked and isolated everyone involved with the case. And so before that, it was something like three to six months. And so because we're doing it quicker, we can more quickly lock down, open up and be normal again. Um, but that is through the methodologies that we worked through with, with that team. So that's what I'm doing now. And I guess part of that, I guess, is, is packaging that offering, which is a bit complex to, to talk through as a professional service to our clients who range from corporate to government to startups. 
Okay, I really want to talk about this because it it strikes me that there is like a global marketing initiative in effect to get people to believe in the vaccine and to want to take the vaccine. And I'm hearing in Australia that there, there is quite a lot of resistance to taking the vaccine and stuff. So what's interesting to me about that is that that is a marketing campaign, that is a marketing effort. So I'm kind of interested to talk about that as well. There's so much I want to talk to you about. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's really interesting that the, the, the challenge over the last, really since the, the 50s, 1950s, is trust. So with marketing and things like vaccines, trust is critical. If we don't trust the messenger, then it doesn't really matter what the message is. So what we're seeing in Australia, it's actually pretty good trust in the government. We, it's funny because different parts of government have different levels of trust. So I was working at Western Sydney University for the last four years before joining Crazy Might Work this year. And one of the studies that our university did was around building trust as a government agency. And Sydney Water was one of those agencies. And so what, what they did was they, they, the academics, with the research that they did around trust, through the Institute for Culture and Society was that they said Sydney Water of all the agencies seems to be the most trusted. Why is that? So they really codified what it is that Sydney Water did that made people trust them the most. Now Sydney Water were more interested in those that don't trust them, you know, those who are really going and buying bottled water. How can we stop that and get them to move out of plastic into drinking from the tap? And they discovered that really it was the early immigrants, recent immigrants, sorry, the recent immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, who were the ones buying the bottles. And through interviews, they discovered the reason they didn't trust Sydney Water was because they had never drunk water out of the tap. They'd come from Iran, Rwanda, places where you don't drink water out of the tap. And when they discovered they could and it was safe, they, we, there was a lot of emotional scenes where they would cry, realising that they are now rich because to their minds, it's only the wealthy who can drink water out of the tap. So this whole journey to discover what it is about trust, and really it was engagement and one-to-one -one communication in that, in that case that changed the, those um, resistant to, to trust. But if you looked at really the rest of Sydney, um, we trust water more than we trust transport. We trust water more than we trust, you know, several other bodies. And New South Wales Health, um, they have many, many channels and methods for, for putting information across. Some of the things that they've done where trust is, is the, the, the result is that the, they've worked with... Um, the tribal leaders, so you'll know Seth Godin's work in, in, with tribes and all that. So they, they work with tribal leaders who, the groups who they want to interact with, they trust the tribal leaders. So in this example with health, it was diabetes and the Samoan community. Samoan community um, don't go to the doctor, but they do go to church and they will listen to what the priest says, but they won't listen to their own mother or a doctor. And so what happened, we took eight churches um, and all of the priests, we gave them the principles around diabetes reduction, exercise, diet and so on. And then that this was, when I say we, the academics at Western Sydney University, where I was before. And so what, what I, and there's a whole point to this story, <laughs> is about okay. how to build trust, which is find the right people who, who our audience trust the most. Uh, now, over 12 months, we saw in the cohort an 8% weight loss. And how that was achieved was that these 12 principles were, were given to the priests to say, do you want your um, congregation to become healthy? Yes. Here are some principles to reduce the diabetes epidemic. And that's among community that are most affected, which is why we started there. 
And so by doing that way, it wasn't an academic coming in or a government agency coming in and saying, here's what you need to do. It was the priests themselves saying, this is what our community need to do. We need to all come together and do this. And so through that journey, they formed new habits. And so now we're seeing that roll out across, I think it's 800 churches, not just Samoan. And uh, different things are happening in different communities. All good. But they, so, for example, we know that the Indian community more likely to embrace physical change, doing yoga, less likely to change their diet. Arabic community more likely to change their diet, less likely to, to try yoga. So each community has had their own variable embracing of these principles. And so it's very personalised. But I guess the way that that messaging and that trust has been built has been finding the right clear set of principles, giving that to the right audience. So if I was selling a product, I would be thinking, what is the right endorser for this product? Who is credible? Because it's not me if no one's heard of me. So I need to think about who do I need to look at this and say, I love it. And then their followers and whatever, a credible leader um, is who I, will, who I will believe. And then I would go ahead and, and take that on. It's a long answer. That's a long answer. It's a great answer. I am really worried now that you've got so much to share with us. If we don't do put, get this really ordered, we'll get, I'm overwhelmed already. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we need to bring some order to this if we can. Yes, okay, yes, so, okay, so that maybe brings us to the next, the next standard question, which is, you know, what is it that you do? Who is it that you do it for? How is it that you get to do it? So, I'm hearing already you're working with universities, you're working with um, New South Wales Water, your or Health, or Sydney Water, New South Wales Health. How do you get into the position where you are doing that kind of work, and how do how do they understand, like, why do they get, how do they get to the point where they're like, okay, we're going to bring Melanie in because. Yeah. Um, also, the crazy might work thing, I really like that. I really, I really like that as a, I don't know, as a, like a message. I really like it. But anyway, we don't have to talk about that. Yeah. So, yeah. We, we, so I, I guess I, a quick answer is that I now work, after doing many of these projects, I now work at Crazy Might Work, which is an innovation firm. So we, we tend to get, um, the big problems that are too hard. And so it, it has tended to be um, in the last couple of years, health predominantly. But we work in strategy, we're at conferences and summits talking about these sorts of things. We do futures thinking and so on. So we, we will present at a law conference, for example, about that sort of thing. And then of course, someone in the audience will say, this is exactly what we're not doing. Um, can you come and run a thing with us? And so we will. So, you know, we do, we do sponsor some things. Right now we're really um, interested in aged care. We're doing a whole thing in aged care it, as Crazy Might Work the company. So we've brought together actors across the system in aged care in response to what Australia has just gone through, which is the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality with 148 recommendations. It's overwhelming for this already very burdened aged care sector. We sponsored the recent summit for that community and ran a couple of free workshops along the way. And of course, through that, we've, we've gathered momentum and gotten more participants in our round table that we're doing. Um, and then, you know, so I suppose that in those round tables, that's where we really get the most intense collaboration. And from there, we usually find that we, we end up working individually with with organizations so our client base grows in that in that way okay and who are your clients exactly um well as i say um health but also for example police we do a leadership program uh nationally in fact there's internationals that come uh for the aipm it's the australian institute for police management uh, these are really executive level leadership programs for for policing um we work with pharmaceuticals and you know big corporates on various challenge areas it's usually about strategy or leadership and we i guess are at the edge because of you don't get called crazy might work and expect to get something normal from us so we're not like the big been around for a long time um you know consulting firms 
we will overlay what we do with experience and newness. So it's really fresh methodologies or fresh use or approaches to those methodologies. And it's also insight. So I guess a lot of word of mouth. And the reason is if you think about one of the recent projects we did with um, a health organization, they were really challenged with how do we train remote and rural clinicians what you know because they they are trying they, they're losing the chance of the, the mentors you might find in the cities and we said well who is the best in the world at remote learning and we thought about NASA so we introduced them to the chief training officer from NASA who spent two hours with these um, coordinators of the health and training and recruitment um, of clinicians and they got these really interesting insights from NASA who we've done work with previously and they were very happy NASA are really collaborative they're really happy to come and spend a couple of hours NASA got something out of it because they started to understand what it's like to be a rural regional nurse in Australia and there are some similarities that are analogous to them as to their astronauts on the moon and one of the things was the heroism that you see from nurses and doctors. Sometimes you are facing a snake bite. I mean, we're talking about Australia. You know, there are things that you have to deal with that really require you to offer up some heroics. In space, if your colleague has a heart attack, you might be trained, but are you a hero? Are you really a health hero in space? And so for NASA, it was, it was a useful and interesting insight to think about their own program and what kind of a person they're going to send to space and how to engender that idea that you are now a hero because really you have to be a doctor for your quality of space if the chips are down and no one's coming you can't ring 911 you're just there and it's you and you've got to save this person's life so um so there's mutual benefit in those connections that we make and from that of course people tend to like these sorts of stories of course they're interesting and then they'll they'll say you've got to work with these crazy people because you know who would have thought? Do they call you the crazy people? Yeah, we in fact in our proposals we put your crazy team and then we list the people who you're going to get on project by project. Yeah. Right. You sort of have okay, to be so crazy to work here, yeah. So forgive me, but this sounds like it shouldn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds. It sounds preposterous. Like, how do you happen to know the chief training officer of NASA? So we happen to know them through a space biology project we did with the university um, 2019, I think we did that. And I was not working inside Crazy Might Work at that time, but Paul Hawkins, who's our boss, he, he was, so he ran that project. But Crazy Might Work as an organisation, they, they worked with a, a series of, um, like the Australian Space Agency, which is new, and, uh, and a university. And it really, we were looking at biology, the human biology in space, waste treatment and whatever. And really, we thought, as crazy might work, who's good at space? NASA. We invited NASA and they're very happy to collaborate. It turned out that NASA and the Australian Space Agency hadn't really had a, a good collaborative, you know, they, they kind of knew of each other, but they hadn't really been involved in a collaboration together. I mean, really, who are we here in Australia? But we have really different laws. There's a, there's a lot of laws in, this, in, in America that, that are a bit unwieldy. So Australia's only just making laws about what we do in space. In America, you have to retain every image you take in perpetuity. So you can imagine the data. In Australia, we don't require that. You can decide what you want to keep. So that's a significant difference in cost if you're doing research in space from Australia versus America. So that's something we wouldn't have thought about when we were making our laws in Australia around our space. But because we know that, we can, we can make these laws work for the user and say, yeah, let's make a law that you don't have to keep every image that you take of space. Now your servers are not required to 
to do that in perpetuity or maybe for a period of time but not forever so there's all sorts of things like that but it was a, that was when nasa got involved with crazy my work and from there built this great relationship through the, the methodologies that we use and then of course from there um, a couple of times we've reached out to nasa and said do you deal with this issue that a client's having and they have nothing to do with space but they're having this issue and NASA will say, yes, actually you should talk to such and such. And that person will, will come on board and spend a couple of hours and all these insights start to happen, which is really exciting for us. It sounds tremendously exciting. So the question I have then is, are all of the solutions that you provide, all of the challenges that you provide, are they all kind of like messaging, marketing, communication type, issues because leadership is about because I think kind of think everything is marketing everything's a pitch you know if you want someone to do something you have to pitch them you have to get them like the more you can motivate them the more you're going to get from them so is everything you do about that and the other thing I want to know is that like everything that you do seems to come from like an academic kind of a place or a scientific kind of a place yeah. so I'm interested in that yeah. so it's two things yeah really evidence-based so I'll come back to that so the first thing about um, we we so hang on, what was the first question? <laughs> the first question is: Is everything that you do kind of marketing in that it's about messaging, influence, um, communication? Is it all really just marketing, or is there some other element to the, uh, networking? Like you're obviously doing a lot of networking. So is it all really just marketing? That's what I want to know. Yeah, so I think there's an element because whatever it is, it's influence. So if if you're actually so really are, we are about driving innovation, and and for impact. Sometimes that's marketing a product, developing a product, ideating, prototyping, and then getting it out there. And so getting it out there is the marketing element of that. Um, we run a shark tank at the end of our process where we invite decision makers and you pitch your ideas and they are the people who are going to take it forward. So really our biggest moment for marketing is selling it to the sharks, if you like, those, those executive leaders who, who support or, or not taking something forward. So within the, that, um, yeah, so I guess that we, we do a lot of things in, which tackle wicked problems, usually social in some way, like the aged care or diabetes. You know, that's sort of our wish is that we want to also make a social difference. It might be bushfire, it might be even economics and job creation. So these are big, big problems. And so it's innovation in those spaces, systems-led thinking, so not just one part of the system trying to change everything for everyone else. And there's the, the marketing piece that we always do is influence because nothing will happen if you don't convince others that this is a good idea. Many ideas are out there. No one cares. We're all busy. So in order to get an idea adopted, we go through, we go through this sort of um, neuroscience, which is really the marketing piece. And so one of the things we use is David Rock's um, scarf drivers, if you've heard of those. Um, and, and, that, and that is saying, if these are our key stakeholders who are going to either kill my idea or make my idea fly, what can I do to influence the chances that they're going to embrace, support and endorse my idea? And so we, we use the SCARF drivers, which is a whole other podcast, <laughs> to... To okay. Really the person on board, but if anyone wanted to look it up, it's it's David Rock. I think two thousand and eight. He, he his model on scarf drivers. You you could just Google, and and I guess the, the first S is for status. So you know, I think Tesla really win on that. They've they've designed their cars to really ensure your friends will compliment you on your amazing Tesla car. There are other things around. Um, environmental credentials and so forth with, with Tesla but if you look at that car it isn't a, it's a beautiful car so they have thought about the 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 status the car is going to afford their buyer and and then there are the other drivers so each of the drivers we go through we have examples and, and so on but so that all of those scarf drivers are really important if you're going to sell or market anything and so for us the moment of influence 
we really work with all of our projects. We bring in the scarf drivers and say, no one's going to support this. Your idea, is, uh, your idea is going to die. Your product will not be purchased. And this is too new and weird. It's not going to happen unless you address these scarf drivers. So, so they need you need to know what it is. And we go through this sort of Cluedo detective game, which helps you to think through um, who's going to kill my idea and let's have a antidote. Who's going to cure or who's going to kill? Yeah, is that yeah, what you're who's going to kill my idea? Kill. Well, yeah, who's going to kill my idea and how can I mitigate the effect of that? So we, we, we create villains and heroes. So there's villains out there who are going to say, this is not going to work, it's unsafe. Now, why have they said that? There's somewhere in these scarf drivers where they, their needs are not getting met. If they were, they'd be going, yeah, I'll endorse. This is fantastic. Everyone should get one. So we, we actually look at the neuroscience behind resistance. And then that leads to influence. And if we can get our responses right, to what is the resistance and make the people who we want to endorse it feel safe, then they are much more likely to endorse it and our idea doesn't die. It gets love. It's love and attention and support. So that in terms of um, do we always do marketing, and yes, that's, that's kind of the journey that we go on in terms of influence. So it's not just the message for our buyer, it's actually the stakeholders and policies of government and the, around our solution that can make it make or break the success of that product. And of course, don't forget competitors because they're, they're not wanting you to succeed unless they want you to succeed for a short time and then fail and everyone comes to them. <laughs> yes. Okay, wow. What a cool conversation. So <laughs> I don't know what I want to know. I know I, I know I want to know like four or five more things. So government, do they see this when you work with government, when you work with the police, when you work with health organisations, if you work for the water suppliers, do they see this as marketing? Do they see what they provide as a product? And if they do, is it healthy to do that? Or... A product or a service is it healthy to i don't know that's kind of what i'm interested in yeah look i think they're transformed so if, if i take a move away from government and think about a a, a traditional uh, corporate that we work with who are really about profit you know for the most part creating products selling them the corporates amongst our clients they are looking to be less unsuccessful as time goes on and to so fail less that's it much better. Okay. <laughs> Fail <laughs> faster and, and, you know, but really less. And so the yes. measure of success with our corporate clients in working with us is have our people gone through your program and, and, and methodologies and come out and are now independently able to think more fully about their ideas. And I will particularly say that Organisations that are, are reasonably cashed up, they can afford to fail more, but that doesn't mean they want to or they should. So those organisations, our, I guess, profitable clients, they are particularly saying it's wasteful that we should just throw money at ideas and, and then just see what succeeds. We should take a more evidence-based approach. So coming back to why do we use these academic you know, evidence-based models and methodologies. We know they work, they're tried and tested, but I think it was Dan Pink who said, um, you know, why doesn't business do what science knows? And there's a frustration behind that. We, we know that with these things work. There's a lot of scientific evidence around neuroscience and all that stuff, how influencing this. Um, and, and then also there are rules about how you interview a client and how you what what is an insight. There's a whole science about what is actually a customer insight and what is not a customer insight. And so we use those evidence-based tools and, and models, which are new to many, many organizations. And we work with the people 
So there's impact. How are you going to impact if you do some cool thing, have a hackathon, everyone goes home, nothing happens? Much better to say, let's unite around a, 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 an outcome. And then we use all the tools in the box to arrive at that outcome. So, we, you know, there's still a lot of flexibility. So if you're an architect building a house, and I'm going off on tangency, but there's always walls. But if you look at 20 buildings, the rules are different. They've all got walls, but every building is different. A church is different to a tent. Both have walls. So there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with structure and evidence-based models. You can still be very flexible within those, but we know that a, a, a dwelling needs walls. So the structure's there, and that's what we provide, is a safe, trusted, evidence-based structure by which you can innovate so that your innovation or product is, is going to work and is also going to be adopted for the client that you're building it for. So in one setting, your client wants a tent and they don't know it yet. In another, they want a church. So your solution will be very, very different, but the way you arrive at that solution is going to be more successful if you do these ethnographic sort of work that we do. So that's, I guess, what we offer. It's a long answer. Again. Okay. So so you've given one answer to the question, why don't corporations do what scientists know works, which is they don't know that it's available to them. Okay. Why else don't they do what science knows works? Yeah. So I think, you know, people are very busy and they might know it, but they might only know it in the innovation team. Or right. they might only know it in the finance team. So the finance team might be fantastic at doing cost-benefit analysis, but does that mean that the innovation team who are sitting on their beanbags, I mean, I'm being very kind of prejudiced here because that's not how they all work, but do they know this? Do you know? So it's a case They all work on beanbags, come on. <laughs> so, so we like to kind of just put a spotlight on diversity. If you, if you, you know, you've probably got these, if you really thought about it, these skills might be available to you as a big corporate across your organisation, but are you connecting the dots? Maybe not. It's often the case that the sales team, the delivery team, the marketing team, the technical team, they don't interface. So at Sussex, we really worked around that problem by creating this lifeboat model, which you may or may not have seen or recalled from there. And that was to bring, um, you know, creative people but from all different parts of an organization into one room together out of the big ocean liner of a, of a corporate and so we had these little rafts if you like or lifeboats and in there you'd have one of everyone you'd have a, a technical person a marketing person a customer service person maybe a finance person and they'd worked together for six months on a particular challenge that the organisation was having, but they had come together as multidisciplinary teams, often multinational, and they'd be able to create a, a solution that was not only going to be embraced by their customer, but that, that actually financially worked, technically worked, and that the customer service person could explain and understand and felt that, yes, that's what the customer wants. So, you know, those, those skills are across our organisation. So part, some of the things that we do when we're working just with one client is that we will bring disciplines from across, not just the innovation team. In fact, that would be a disaster, just work with the innovation team. We never, ever do that. We always work with a diverse group. And so we, we want to say, let's bring who we've got someone in. and at different levels. We don't just want the CEO. We don't just want the receptionist. We actually want people from all levels, from strategic to tactical to operational, to come and get involved together because they actually share and cross-fertilise. And it's such a missing thing. We're busy, so it's not our job. I'm not helping you because I'm working on my thing. And so by chucking everybody out of the life, the, um, the ocean liner into this lifeboat, it's a way to say, let's think more quickly because you can, you make fast decisions, take a lot more risks in that setting. And let's make sure we've represented all the skills we need. 
So they go, well, that lifeboat's only got accountants. All right, let's mix it up. So half of you accountants get out. Let's throw some marketing people in there. You know, I think by mixing up those disciplines, you do get more. Well, there's a lot of evidence about that as well. Multidisciplinary teams produce better innovation. Okay. I'd never, th none of this had ever even occurred to me. Okay, good. So that works. What do I want to know about now? I want to know about, um, I, I want to do another chat so we can do this whole scarf drivers stuff. And um, so that would be cool if we could do that in the future. I'm interested in the thing, I, I'm interested in science because it seems to me right now that science is having a crisis of trust a little bit because it's being presented as untrustworthy or it's presenting itself as untrustworthy so i don't know if that's too conspiratorial to have that conversation but i'm kind of interested in how science fixes itself and becomes more trustworthy and then the other thing i want to talk about today definitely is this first customer thing so if you are an, an innovative startup then how do you get your first customer? So maybe it makes sense that we do the science and the trust thing first. So for example, what I'm seeing because of, of my echo chamber is I'm seeing um, the USA's leading scientist, Anthony Fauci, lying and then admitting that he's lied. And he's done this two or three times. And I think this is undermining what is a really important, really important position which is, you know, the world needs to get back to normality. And the person that the world's leading economy has put in charge of this is admitting that he's lying. So how do people have faith in that when he's, he's admitting that he's lying? So that's what I'm interested to know first. Yeah, look, I think science has had a roller coaster in terms of its brand and trust in the last year and a half because at the very beginning of the pandemic a lot of radical trust was was given to science and and then things started to unravel when it got distracted with politics and so i think the more that i mean the more that science gets intermingled with politics the more risky it is for us to then try and build trust in that political setting. But if you take science out of politics, the places where that exists, science has had a good rap and has, has been on the up. So we are more relying and, and, and wanting evidence and, and, and things. And certainly I'm seeing that in corporate Australia um, and a APAC region that we, we, because things are moving so very fast, in fact, there was a, an academic said in a, a couple of few weeks ago, a longitudinal study is four weeks now. It used to be 10 years, but of course, things are moving so fast that um, we, we really could just do a study in four weeks and then four weeks later, it's a, it's a whole new world. So we've got to start again. So it's just funny to imagine that that's how academics are now looking at longitudinal studies. But um, I guess that the, yeah, the, the journey for science has been, we completely rely on you, you're lying to us. And then back, I think it's it's half, it, it depends where the science is, is being presented from. So in Australia, we've had the chief medical officer um, and state level counterparts presenting and, and the trust in Australia is very, very good. So I do think it's country by country. So in Australia, we've got a really good trust in, in our scientists. And some of those who get up are, of course, epidemiologists from universities who are not working for the government. Um, and so they might seem to be a puppet, you know, you might say, because they're presenting alongside government, but they in their own right are very independent and very vocal and, and will not defend any, any attack on government. They just give facts and say, this is the facts about hand washing. This is what we know about this and what we know about that. So I think we're doing a better job with our scientists in Australia than some other countries in terms of giving them the independence that they need. So yeah, I do think it's where the message is delivered from. And 
um, and America is a whole other animal where it comes to science and our propensity to, to believe and follow science. It's about the channel for, for where that message is coming from. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or comes, yeah. Well, it kind of does because for me, everything is marketing. So it's about, and, and, and marketing is about having this trust and like you're saying, it's about influence and all of these things but they've got themselves into such a mess where now this 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 idea that clearly not that clearly this idea that this was science made is now has now gone mainstream it was on like the the colbert show like 2 3 days ago yeah. and i think you're right i think it's not only about um, the state of the relationships and the influences in the country, but also the population of the country and the way they want to receive the message. So Australia, I think, is always a little uh, more cynical or more challenging of science. Like you've seen this on climate change, you've seen this on that there are vocal communities who are prepared to challenge these things. And I think that's probably healthier. So I think that that's how you get a trustable situation because scientists in Australia are used to being challenged, whereas maybe in the States, they are much less. And I don't understand, like science will always be politicized because it's, because it's like the leading authority in the world, you know? So it's the control mechanism and it's all about how resources are distributed. So it's going to be politicized. I think science is in, in kind of trouble, but you know more about this than I do. So when I ask you about how we respond now to the current situation, pandemic-wise, you can, or maybe now you can let me know. What do you think? Yeah, listen, I think that's the magic words, how we respond. So um, I think it's, it's actually true that all scientists are criticised and attacked. In America, equally to Australia, how Australian science responds is very different to how American science responds. So the response is in some settings, silence um, or shutting down of the question. And the mistake that that does is it, it, it um, reduces transparency and then you seem to have a secret and then we get very suspicious. In Australia, when we get a question we, and we're challenging and attacking, we tend to answer it much more transparently. So for example, when the cruise ships came to Sydney in February, I think it was February, March last year, that's when we had our first moment when COVID really took off and we get we had we had 20,000 cases and it was it was starting to be you know a real thing. The Prime Minister was really attacked at a, at a press conference and challenged about you know should the cruise ships be accountable? and for, for what's happened to Australia. And he said, I think everyone has made mistakes and we're allowed to make mistakes. It's the first pandemic we've had uh, in our living experience. And so we have to be give people a bit of a minute to be allowed to make mistakes. And he said, we will make more. We've made mistakes. We're still making mistakes today and we're going to make more. This is unprecedented if you remember that word being every second sentence it's unprecedented so we're going to make mistakes so an admission that we are we're doing things wrong is a really you wouldn't have heard that from from trump i think that's not it, it, whatever happened there's a narrative about we're right and it's and, and everyone else you know we've done we're doing it right which i think really as the general public we don't want to hear that there's been no mistake we prefer to hear there's a mistake because then we can get on with fixing it and we we can come from a place of compassion <laughs> rather than judgment and if you create an adversary um then we will we will step up and be the adversary to you so it's actually you know if you look at also um Brené Brown's the other one I want to reference on trust because she's done that great model on braving which is the acronym around how trust is created and the first one is boundaries um B for boundaries so I think um you know she's got some great sort of codified ways for how do you build trust and who was that what was that name um Brené Brown Bren A. Brown. B-R-E-N-E. Bren A. Brown. She's got, I think it's now the most watched TED Talk ever. <laughs> um, 
on vulnerability. She studies vulnerability and shame and has done for more than 20 years. And but she's got some she's got a podcast and all that. But but her her messaging around trust, which we have referenced in several of our work with clients as well. Um, the first one is boundaries. So if you're in a relationship or you're leading a team or you're mentoring or whatever it is, the first thing you want is good trust. And with your brand, you want trust. If you're going to build a trusted brand, the first thing would be, what are your boundaries? Are you reliable? If you say something's going to get delivered in three days, is it going to be delivered in three days? Otherwise, change your brand promise to five days. That way you're delivering and you're reliable. We'd rather know and, and so on. So if you went through that acronym and V is vulnerability. Sorry, V is the fault. Secrets, keeping secrets, but keeping secrets for you, not from you. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the whole lot of things in braving um, that are worth looking at if you're thinking about how do I how do I build trust? How as an organization, what are the first things that I need to do? So it's what do I do, what not do I do? How do I I think the thing about respond, how do I respond when attacked? That is the difference. That's a critical point for any vendor. If if you have sold a toy that's flammable, your response to that better be transparent and apologetic. I think actually Volkswagen have done it pretty well. They quietly dealt with the fact that they lied about the emissions in their cars at during a period of two, three years of testing. And they apologised and then they've done corrective action for all of the vehicle owners. Yes. So. Okay, so I'm with you. So I think that there are different different flavours of science. So certainly, like, and the three that I probably the one the three that I'm most exposed to might be Australia, well, probably the UK, the US, and Australia. And I think the the particular flavour of science in USA wants to be infallible, wants to be bulletproof. And the issue with that, like we know with brands, is that if you get one crack in that, then the whole thing is broken, which it seems to me that it is. So, okay, so that's cool. And the and I think of science as a belief system and as a brand. And so I think of these things in exactly the same way. So how they come back is going to be really interesting. I've not seen um, Brenny Brown, and I'm going to go and check. I've not seen any of the stuff you're talking about. So um, the thing that I'm also interested to hear from you is this first customer thing that you referenced right at the very beginning. Yeah. Because what I say to people is that essentially um, sales and marketing is the puzzle that you have to fix in your business. So it's the riddle that you have to fix. Like you have to work out how it is that you're going to find, win and keep customers profitably. And it sounds to me like because you were in those 500 start tech startups um, all the way back 2006, 2007, that you have a methodology for fixing that riddle. Or is that, or is the way I'm framing this different from the way that you think about it? No, you're right. In fact, through to 2013, so... Um, right through to 2013 and through to 2016 in Australia then. So um, working with startups, get your first customer. So I think, you, you know, you can have a great idea and you can play around with it uh, for as long as you like, but until you get it in front of people, you don't know if it's going to work. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I could talk for hours about, you know, really you should talk to it to customers before you even begin thinking about a product. But let's say you haven't done that. Let's say you have in your mind come up with a great idea and you've then gone on and built a product and now you want to sell it. And imagine that you haven't yet spoken to a customer and you've got to start somewhere. So uh, if, if you did that, um, you're, you're less likely in my mind to succeed, but you still could. So that's product journey one is I built something and I'm now going to go and find a customer. And then but in that instance, you're just going to get lucky. Well, you know, it's like it like if if you have the good luck to hit on something that actually there's a market for completely in isolation, that is just luck. Yes. And I mean, you can increase your luck 
by understanding truly what the benefits are of your product. So not your features, not your advantages, but your benefits. So then it, you look at your benefits of having your product and think, who cares about that? So is it going to make you look younger? Well, there's a very, that already limits who's going to be more interested in that and who is less interested in that. So what are the actual benefits of your product and who cares about that the most? And then you would reach out to them. And one way to do that, let's say it was the aged care sector, would be to go to an aged care conference or go and visit an aged care facility and say, we've developed this, what do you think? More humility in that early stage that one comes with, the more likely that that person will not only trial your product, but recommend it to someone else who might also you should talk to, who, who could help you or could trial it or endorse it. Um, and also to give you suggestions about how to make it more trustworthy as a product in the market. You know, you need to go and get it such and such certified and then everyone will buy it. And an example of that recently for me was talking to a state agency, government agency, and saying, you know, we, we, we do innovation services. And that agency, state agency said, you know what, you just need to become a preferred supplier. And these are the different categories that you should be preferred on, because that's who I would go to if I was hiring you. And so for me, I know what I need to do now to become an easier option for them when they're procuring a service I offer. But how would I know that? Had I, unless... I would go and talk to them and say, here's what we do. What do you think? Is that something you'd use? How would you go about? What are the steps that I need to do to become someone you'd use or a product that you would use? So, um, so the other thing is really market intelligence is everything. Understanding your customer, if you've got these benefits. I mean, what, one of the, the things that I did was university enterprise, working with academics in the University of Sussex. So they'd come to us with these inventions. They'd say, I think that this is for X, Y, Z market. And sometimes it was just the wrong market. So one example was a really indestructible um, device that you could do ECG testing of a person. And they said, we think this is for home care market in aged care. You know, they can, because it's mobile, the nurses can come and go and visit your home and this and this, if they drop it, it's all good. And so good for mobile. And we sort of went, mm, okay, well, that's interesting. But actually, indestructible ECG, that feels to me more useful in a defence setting because those people are really bashing it around. If it falls off a tank and gets backed over, can it still, they're like, yes, it's indestructible. I'm like, yeah, that feels like it's more important if you're out in the desert running over it in a tank than if you're just, you know, quietly going from house to house. And so we shifted the market to defence who were much more interested in that solution than the health market were at that time. So it's just thinking about the benefits of your product. And, and in that case, robustness was more important for a different market entirely than the one they had first thought of. So that can be avoided if you first talk to the customer and do user-centered design. <laughs> um, but if you haven't done that, then you've got to listen to the customer and then switch markets if, if you see so you what I mean. So there's this kind of a so in terms of finding your first customer, you either design it with them or you listen to the customer and pivot, go to a different market. Cool. So in the latest episode of my What the series, I did product development because I've got a thing. I've got a million things. That's why, you know, I can talk to anyone about all this stuff because I've got a million issues that annoy me, upset me. But it annoys me, upsets me that, um, that products are invented in a silo, that they don't engage their marketing people who should understand the marketing. They don't engage their salespeople who should have relationships with their actual customers. Like the boffins go away and produce this thing and then they expect sales and marketing to kind of foist it on the marketing unless they have the good fortune to meet someone like you and say, wait a minute, you know, you need to understand something about the market before this happens. Good. So I agree with everything that you're saying. And my whole shtick, I suppose, my whole thing about sales and marketing 
is it's centered on this cost of customer acquisition. So if you are proactively marketing, you're in the business of buying customers, the more cost effectively you can do that. And the, the higher the customer value, the, the average customer value, the more profitable you are. So I've kind of got this view of a, a, um, a perfect cycle, a virtual cycle where you win the customer, you fix their issue, you talk to them about other issues, you develop solutions to those issues, and it goes on and on and on forever. So good. I just wanted to, I just wanted to let you know I'm really glad that you also think that. <laughs> I'll tell you something that I'm really getting into look, I've been since I was 10, but is storytelling. Right. So I really think for the first customer, you need to tell a really once upon a time story that is so beautiful with an amazing happy ending that that, that the customer can't help being drawn in. And that story needs to be short and emotional and unexpected. So I think unexpected and emotional are often missing from the stories that you hear about new things. Because, but it should be unexpected because it's new, but we sort of think, oh no, don't make it too weird. So our stories are not are not as weird as they should actually be. <laughs> so right. the real the companies that I've worked with, certainly in, in Sussex, those are hundreds and hundreds of companies. The ones that did really well, um, they their stories were very humble, you know, but they were very personal, very emotional. You know, my mother had Alzheimer's and then I've developed this amazing thing. Or I ride bikes, but I just always wanted to feel like Lance Armstrong and I knew I'd never make it. So I've developed this little thing that I put on my, my bike and it can tell me how I compare with Lance Armstrong's performance. Is it an engine? Sadly, no. <laughs> it's not a rocket. It's a rocket. Look, I'm the same as him. But... You know that, that's much more interesting, and I've I've done an app that tracks how I work, how I do on my my bike run. No, I want an app that tells me how I compare with Lance Armstrong. So it, it's more personal, and it's more interesting. So it, 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 it's also simple. It's simple, unexpected, emotional. So I think that that it, the storytelling, and there's a lot of really interesting podcasts. In fact, I really recommend listening to children's book writing podcasts. Because if you can tell a story to a 10-year-old, then you've got a really good chance of hitting everyone else. And they are brutal audiences in a fantastic way. They will help you edit. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, if you can get your story right for that audience, you're, you're on your way. But I think there's a lot of, you know, stuff about. I'll, I'll give you an example of, of how few words you actually need to tell a good story. So Ernest Hemingway famously was um, in a bar with his other very famous writer friends and they were arguing about who can tell the shortest story and still create all the things that you want from a story. And they were like 10 words. I can do it in a page. I can do it. And Ernest Hemingway said, I can write a story in six words. And so... He got a napkin and they're all laughing like you can't do it. And he wrote on the napkin, for sale, full stop, baby's shoes, full stop, never worn. Oh. In itself, that's an emotional story in six words. And so it's possible to tell an amazing, emotional, moving story. In, in much fewer words than we think. But you can see that by telling a story like that, it doesn't take much, but it's, it's something I'm going to tell someone else. Yes. It has everything you need. And what we don't do is yes. it. Wow. It's a great story. It's not my story. <laughs> it's such a... Yeah, well, it's a terrible <laughs> story, really. Terrible story, but an incredible lesson in the importance yeah. of emotion in a good story. Okay, I can I can bring some brevity to this situation. I can tell you about the shortest the shortest joke. Do you know the shortest joke? Oh, go. Okay. Two words. <laughs> Is that it? 
it, no, no, no. It is two words. I haven't started telling you the joke yet. It's only two words. Okay, the shortest joke is dwarf shortage. <laughs> All right. That's a crisis. Yes. That's a crisis. Okay, good. So let's, because I think we've already gone for more than an hour. So are you able to tell us in like five or 10 minutes about your recommendation? Because I know you've got some insight because you're connected to the scientific community about how people should be responding to the ever-changing situation. So, you know, where we are now is it's June 2021. So obviously... Um, We've been dealing with the pandemic since March 2020. Various countries are looking at coming out of lockdowns. Um, tourism isn't happening. Travel isn't happening. There is the whole situation with the vaccine. The thing about the vaccine passports is coming around again. So this is kind of what's going on now in June 2021. So what is your recommendation then for people who are looking to respond now? Well, I guess the good news is that many of the longest, most durable com companies were founded in recessions and depressions. So if you started your company in this period, you're in very good company. It's a great time to start a company is in a recession, a depression, a crisis. Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, um, hundreds more. There's, there's many, many companies who started during a crisis time and they are more, have more longevity than companies that didn't. So that's the first thing if you're a startup. Good, excellent, do it. The second I guess is collaborate. And I think that we now have these sorts of platforms which everyone's embraced. And there are so many ways to get to people who you are. I mean, I was talking to the um, chief, chief health officer for Qantas globally. Now, who am I? Who am I? But he, he made an hour for me. And, and that is because companies like Qantas and, and, and others around the world who, who might not have had time, now the crisis is so big that they are making time. So really... Okay, so that was the chief, who was that? Chief Health Officer for Qantas. Health Global, Officer for Qantas. Global, yeah. Along with the Group Head of Health and Wellbeing. So both responsible okay. for the wellbeing of their staff globally. And so if you... I reckon five years ago, they may not have given me time. Because of what's happening at the moment, People are more accessible. You know, they're not having to travel. So it's actually a really good time to collaborate and reach out. So I think be ambitious. Just be audacious about who you think you want to talk to. And more importantly, who you want to listen to, because we got some fantastic insights talking to them um, around mental well-being and, you know, because the, the airline industry is famously challenged in that area. So collaborate is my summary. Collaborate. I think use evidence. There's a lot of evidence out there that's just ignored. Business evidence, market intelligence. Um, intuition is a big thing with, you know, innovation, but actually there's a lot of science that you can fast track your way rather than trying to work it out the hard way. So I think it's just really underestimated the power of data and science. Um, universities have access to an unbelievable amount of data and they are, of course, government funded the world over. So there's many places you can go and get that data in some way, shape or form by working and collaborating with universities. Um, and I guess the third thing is practice telling stories in wherever you are in your day. There's a story everywhere. And it's really interesting when you start looking around and noticing uh, on the bus or, you know, just making a copy. Everything has a really quite interesting story you could tell with a beginning, a middle and an end um, and throw in some emotion. So I think just practising storytelling is a really helpful skill because it's really the beginning of influence and persuasion. 
Good. I think that's really strong advice. Were you there in 2019? I was at, um, I presented at Brighton City College. I know Mike Hurd was there, but that was for me, I came up with this presentation, which was basically how to, um, how to address that crisis at that time, the 2008 financial crisis. And um, I came up with this thing, which was um, get excited and kick ass because more millionaires are made during the recessions and all those things. Yeah, so that was my crowning glory. It would have been really cool if you'd been there, but it's not sounding like you were. Um, So, but I think, I think it's right. This feels different. This feels very different. Although it feels very different now from the way it felt in March last year. In March last year, it felt like bodies were going to start piling up you know it felt like like tens of millions of people could be dying from this in which case it felt entirely inappropriate to be marketing or selling anything except i think the reason that that better businesses are um, founded in really difficult times is for two things people have real issues that need to be addressed so if you can identify what those issues are and find Um, and find solutions for them, then that makes sense that you will find markets. And the second thing is, I think they have to be more resilient because there is less, you know, what's the saying? Uh, Hard times create soft, um, hard men. Hard men create soft times. Soft times create soft men. Like that kind of situation. So I think that's really good advice. I think that's really good advice. It's also um, confidence. When confidence wanes, then people are more open. Uh, so okay. it, it, what we saw with, with 2020 is, is an increase in doubt. And so to have the Prime Minister say of Australia, we have made some mistakes, we're going to make some more, that's not what you hear from, from a Prime Minister. That's not allowed. So to hear that on national news, we're making mistakes, we're going to make more, that increases our sense that, first of all, we're going to make mistakes. If that's true, well, you know, we might as well make good ones, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it, but it increases the, 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 the feeling that we, we're vulnerable and we don't know what we're doing. So as a nation, we, we, we could, we, and it's, it's, I saw this echo a bit across the world. Like we, we were all, we're all experimenting. We're still in this experiment. However, there's a lot of, data if you look at an epidemiologist and how they codify pandemics and say yeah then we've got the roaring 20s this is not our first rodeo it's just our personal first time but it's not the first time the world has had this it's happened before and here's the pattern and we've codified it is anyone listening so so i really think it's a case of turn to science and see what the patterns are to predict what the market's going to do although it'll be shorter as we've seen in product life cycles everything's happening quicker but I think when you do get a crisis and things, doubt creeps in, confidence wanes, that's a great time to go in. Yeah, and, and because, that, because there's more openness and more vulnerability. Yes, and because people are looking for leadership and people are looking for a way out, you know. So for me, I don't think I have quite your faith in science. For me, it's all just stories, which comes back to this storytelling thing. So if you can come up with a great story and, you know, so I'm thinking about this little mission that I'm on. I mean, I'm on this mission because I kind of feel like if I discharge all of everything I know about marketing in the next year or two, then I could have fulfilled my obligation to marketing. I can step away and I'm bringing people like you in to to get also what you know, just in case of what I don't know is very good. (laughs) So, but it's a good story. You know, I want people to be successful. I really do. I can't help them all physically, but I can produce all of this content and I can cut through the BS and I can put really bright people in front of you because for me, marketing is always like now we're seeing it's the example but it's always about knowing understanding markets and identifying the needs and wants of those markets and fulfilling the needs and wants of those markets so that is really what marketing is should be but it gets lost i think melanie this was so much more interesting than even i could have hoped for fantastic yeah and look it's it's much more important so what the most important thing is your audience the least important thing is the idea. 
everyone has okay a, most important is your audience you know so so if, if, if you haven't worked out who your audience is then that, 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 that's the thing. So, I mean, yeah, getting that message, the message can change depending on the audience. But bottom line, if whatever you're doing, you better just spend your, your mission in life is to find the right audience first. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That- and in a true marketing sense, that's that for me is a market. You know, like we're, we're used to talking about audiences now in the last 20 years, this has become the thing, but it's essentially your market. So whether it's your yeah, market for your right. product or your information or for your insights or for your leadership, it's it's a market. I think that's absolutely correct. Okay, then. So, who would you recommend I speak to? Who should I reach out and speak to next on this this little mission that I'm on? You know, if I was if I was thinking about the sort of work we do at Crazy Might Work, um, I would highly recommend including people who know nothing about marketing. So Good. Get, I like that. So that that's get, crazy. It might work right? Multidisciplinary. So for example, why wouldn't you talk to uh, someone who manages the line enclosure at a zoo? You know, like someone completely out there uh, or, or someone who has to deal with audiences like Hollywood and talk about someone in Hollywood around storytelling. Pixar, who, who we, we reference Pixar a lot in our work around storytelling. So I'd be looking at um, someone who, who really isn't a marketing person, if you ask them, but could offer in some different disciplines around that. And the other, the other people I'd think I'd consider is actually an accountant slash chief uh, finance officer, someone money, because what I find working with startups, they have two weaknesses. It's usually marketing or finance, and they're so interrelated because finance have to fund the marketing. Marketing has yes. to an outcome for the finance. And, and so they're usually the two areas that are, are, are neglected or, you know, diminished because they because there's too much excitement about everything else, <laughs> the idea. Yes. So, so bringing, there's a lot of courses out there, of course, for, you know, people to do finance courses for non-finance people. Um, so why not bring, like, what does marketing look like to a finance person? And, uh, and that would be a really interesting thing to hear. And what yes. does a storyteller think is important about telling a compelling narrative? How would they approach that if it came to being a product? And someone who's not done it but does know storytelling. So those are kind of, I guess, some suggestions of where I'd go next. Okay. Do you have individuals that you'd recommend or not necessarily? Probably a whole handful of people. Um, certainly in Sydney, there's. Um, it depends on what's easiest for you. So there are some people who run, like the um, Anthony Ullman. He's a professor at Western Sydney University. He he is the director of the um, Institute for Writing and Society, and so he lectures in uh, in writing and storytelling. So there's okay. So he, he's he's a guy that uh, really interesting guy. Lots of interesting things you could tell talk about cool if you could give me an introduction that would be really really useful i feel like i'm putting you on under pressure now to <laughs> disclose your rolodex but i'm not i'm just really want to i really am interested to see where this goes you know who is it that i can talk to and what is it that can they can bring and what are the insights and stuff melanie this has been so cool thank you so much you're welcome really interesting and great to see you i'm very jealous that you're in bali and um yeah i will send you this recording Okay, that would be fantastic. I really need you to do that because I don't have it. And um, maybe you and I can sit down again in two or three months' time and do a take two. I think we've opened some channels here that we haven't closed quite, and I think it'd be really interesting to understand more about those. Yeah, look, I'd love to talk about assessing your idea because uh, that's a dark art. Is your idea a good idea or a bad idea? Stuff like that's really important. Okay, I'm going to write this down assessing your idea yeah because marketing it's one thing but should you is the is the question you want to ask is this actually a good idea yes yes and and there's a there's a really really systematic way to do that okay super cool well we've got that and there were another couple of things that you touched on so we've definitely got something to talk about and i think it'll be two or three months when i come back to you you are an absolute legend thank you so much you're welcome And uh, And I will speak to you again soon.